in the cloud. All right, welcome back to the fun office hours, everybody. Uh, it's September 5th, and uh, welcome, welcome back. Uh, first thing on the agenda that I wanted to talk about is feedback from the first fun training that we've had that we had two months ago now. Um, we had a survey and got some feedback, and I just wanted to have a brief discussion about how that went and get any additional feedback that anybody wants to provide. Uh, then after that, I've got some uh, presentation and demo uh, for parallel programming in Fortran, specifically with co-arrays. Uh, so we can kind of go through something like that. And then we'll have time for just open discussion. Uh, anything else anybody wants to talk about Fortran related. So let's get started with feedback from the first fun training. Uh, so we had a two half day sessions and on the first day we had 132 attendees and 87 stuck around for the second day. Uh, we got 22 responses to our post training survey and the overall response was very positive. 90% uh, rated it very good or excellent. Uh, the FPM and veggies segment, uh, most people kind of found to be the least useful. I suspect it was just that those presentations probably need more improvement, uh, examples, exercises. Uh, basically, it was just kind of, those were presentations that I've given before, and I just kind of grabbed them and used them as is and didn't, probably should have done a little bit more prep work and put some more stuff together for that. Um, we got some mixed responses to the compiler error messages, modules and submodules, drive types, those those segments of the presentation. Um, that's kind of to be expected, I think. Uh, if if that's the stuff that you are interested in learning about, or then yeah, you probably enjoyed it. If it's stuff you already knew about, or for the, some of the drive type stuff, if it's stuff you're just not ready for, yeah, I can see where that's not not where you're at and not what you're interested in. So yeah, I could see mixed responses to that. Uh, most requested topics for future trainings. Parallel programming was right up there in terms of co-raise, MPI, do concurrent, OpenMP, OpenACC. Um, we got a little bit of mixed uh, response to the co-array aspects of things that I showed. Some people love it, some people hate it, but uh, there's definitely interested in parallel programming in general. Object-oriented programming, the inheritance, polymorphism, some of the advanced features of the object-oriented features of the language. So there's some interest in those. Uh, interoperation with other languages, and Python is high on that list. So people want to know, well, yeah, for, I understand Fortran is fast for some things, but I really like the other languages. Can I do both? The answer is yes. Um, and yeah, we can provide a training on how do you do that. Uh, most requested extra content, uh, environment setup instructions. So how do I get my compiler installed and set up? How do I set up an editor? How do I get other any other tools installed and configured? That kind of stuff, which I can totally understand. That you could spend a whole day getting your getting your environment set up. And yeah, I, a good training session on that would probably be useful. So that's kind of the feedback that we've gotten so far. If anybody is interested in providing additional feedback, I'm glad to hear it. Um, so give anybody an opportunity to just go ahead and say what's on your mind. Okay. Well, I responded I oh, in the survey, and uh, mm -hmm. I, I liked it. I even saved the recorded playlist. I think I'm going to refresh, refresh maybe once in a while. Uh, for me, those compiler error runtime time modules was basically still very useful refresher. Mm -hmm. So I, 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 like, I love it. Yeah, FYI, if anybody didn't know, yeah, the whole the whole session is uploaded to YouTube. So if you ever want to go back and refresh, take a look at any of that stuff, uh, it's all up there on the NERSC YouTube channel. So I would like to start thinking about 
when we should try and schedule another one and what the topic should be. So if anybody wants to start providing feedback on that, I'm happy to listen for that, any of that as well. Well, on a conquer, it's a great training that you provided. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks, Ellen. I, I, I enjoy do I enjoy putting the stuff together and and having the discussions. So and share your expertise. It's wonderful. Yeah. Um, so yeah. the requested topics like co-arrays, for example, mm -hmm. we had another one right with the PGAS on co-array, Fortran, C yep. and C plus plus. Um, so. We, and and you're gonna talk about core rate fortune today as well. Yeah, yeah, I can a little bit. I, I mean, yeah. they can only do so much in like half an hour, but uh, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll have a discussion and have a, have we'll, we'll look at something. Yeah. Or if you wanna just uh, provide recording and then do Q and A like without you doing an, an, another training presentation, that's okay too. Yeah, I'm I'm open to different formats as well. Uh, I I like the as interactive as we can be for kind of formats. Um, sometimes the, the large group remo all remote is hard to have very interactive, but um, so yeah, if there's any ideas for other formats that we can provide the training or, you know, open to ideas. Yeah, so. we haven't tried like showing a longer-ish video during the training and then we watch it at the same time then do an mm. And a uh, or hands on like interleave, but then we we do have like short videos right recorded during training. Mm -hmm. We've done that a lot. We have some some reverse classroom like people watch things, have done some exercises before coming to a training that have been done before. But okay. watching a pre recorded, a uh, previous training then do a Q and A we haven't done, but we we could experiment, or you could do live presentation because then you get lots of um, mm -hmm. questions during your presentation. Yeah, I my style is I love to just do kind of live demos and then people can point things out and I can go, oh yeah, here's how you do it, like live. Um, but that's not everybody's favorite in terms of watching. So I, I don't know. Um, anyway, so if there's no other comments or suggestions or feedback, uh, we can move on and talk about co-arrays. So parallel programming with co-arrays, some beginner examples. And this is just high level, brief overview type stuff. You can really go down the rabbit hole with this stuff. Um, so if you've got questions, if you want me to point you at more things to look at, yeah, we can, you could certainly spend a lot more time on this, but I wanted to give everybody a brief overview of what is what does it look like to try and start using some of the parallel features that are built into the language. So what are co-arrays? So the Fortran execution model is single program, multiple data. Each image, uh, which is equivalent to like process, or if you're familiar with MPI, a rank, um, each image execute the exact same program. All of the images are created at program startup and live to program termination. Images can take different branches through the program, right? So uh, you can have conditional execution based on what image is which, and they can kind of take different branches through the program. That's okay. Um, and then images can do synchronization or coordination of their execution. And then images can communicate data. How do images communicate that data? Um, co-arrays is basically the, the, the foundational mechanism. Uh, co-arrays are a partitioned global address space, meaning each image has a symmetric copy of a co-array. It's a, it's a variable and each image gets a copy. It has their own, their own copy that is viewable from other images. So any image may refer to a co-array on any other image. Uh, there's some nuances related to teams, but that's one of the advanced features that we probably won't get into today. Um, but for the most part, yeah, any image can refer to the data in a co-array on any other image. 
because of that, allocation and deallocation are implicitly synchronization points. If you allocate a co-array, all of the images must finish allocating that co-array before any of the images can continue execution, right? So that's that's that guarantee that there, there is a symmetric copy of a co-array on the other image, right? So no image can go start trying to reference that data because they've all gotten past the allocation point. Setting up the environment. Um, so if you're doing this stuff on Perlmutter, we've got two ways you can compile and execute uh, your co-array code. We've got the open co-arrays module, which is the open source runtime that the GNU G4Tran compiler can make use of to actually uh, support running co-array code in parallel. By default, you can compile uh, co-array code with G4Tran with just dash F co-array equals single. So it will at least accept the co-array syntax, but then it will just run one image. Um, open co-arrays is the runtime library that lets you actually run things in parallel. And so if you module load the open co-arrays module, uh, and then compile with dash F co-array equal lib, uh, then it's a parallel executable. Uh, the Cray compiler supports co-arrays right out of the box. So just FTN your program, and you can just S run it with multiple, multiple images. Um, now we'll start looking at some examples. Uh, I've got these examples are open source at my GitHub page, uh, everything functional. Uh, the yep. repository's name just co-array examples. Um, some basic ideas. First, let's start with well, how do we distinguish between images? So um, I'm going to actually run all of these examples locally because I'm going to make use of the numerical algorithms compiler, NAG. Uh, because one of the examples can only be compiled by that compiler, uh, but all of the rest of them, G4Tran or Cray, can compile and execute on Perlmutter. I'll point out the one when we get to it. Um, so read me just some simple examples. Uh, I'm going to use the FPM Fortran Package Manager to compile and run the, the examples. Uh, but for the most part, they're standalone, but there's a couple where I make use of uh, an external dependency. And so this just makes that a little bit easier. Um, but they're all just, all the examples end up just being listed directly in the TOML file. So first example, the bare minimum thing you can do to actually observe parallel execution, really you can, the, the shortest Standards conforming Fortran program is just three letters. The end keyword. The shortest con uh, standards conforming parallel Fortran program Shoot. is exactly the same program. It's inherently it's an inherently parallel language. That said, there's not really anything interesting about a program that does nothing. So, what is the simplest way you can kind of observe that? The language is in fact a parallel language. Uh, you can you can ask which image am I and how many images are there. The critical construct is a only one image can be in this block at a time. This kind of guarantees that when you produce output that it doesn't get mixed up and garbled together. Uh, in most cases, that's probably not necessary for just a single print statement. But as you start to get to some like slightly more advanced things, you probably want to do stuff like this. Like you don't want to try and in parallel write to the same file. You might get stuff mixed up. So this is just kind of an example of how do you do that. Uh, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, so. How do we run this? FPM run. Like I told, like I said, I'm going to use the NAG4 compiler. Uh, here's all the flags that I like to use by default for um, making sure that my code is got all the checks turned on and things like that. 
Um, and then the dash co array flag says tell it, hey, yeah, I'm I'm running some co array code here. Uh, and then the name of the example I'm about to run. And there you go. Uh, I have a four core machine, so it runs four images by default. And you get hello from image one of four, two of four, four of four, three of four, right? So there's nothing that says that each image does it in order. So yeah, you can get out, out, out of order execution. So there you go. There's a, a relatively simple parallel program for Fortran. Uh, the next example, let's do something slightly more complicated. How do we, what's the simplest way we can do data communication between images? Turns out there are what are called collective subroutines that don't actually require co-arrays. Uh, the simplest one is co-broadcast. It says, take the data from this image and give it to every other image. So, so basically what we're going to do is the image with the highest number, so num, num images, is going to create this message. So this is an internal write to a character variable. So hello from image. And then it's going to give that message to all of the rest of the images. And then one at a time, there's that critical block again, one at a time, they're going to print it out. So what does that look like? Co-broadcast. Right, so in whatever order they have sent the message and then print it out in semi-random order, whichever image happens to get there first. So that's the simplest form of communication between executing images is something like co-broadcast. Let's start to get to some slightly more advanced things and Here's where we actually start having co-arrays. So let's make that message variable a co-array. The syntax is square brackets. So uh, when, when they were designing the co-array features of the language, they were like, what is the smallest change we can make to the language to make it an, a parallel language? And square brackets was about all that was really necessary. So the square brackets uh, give what is called the co-dimensions. If you have a static co-array, i.e. it's not allocatable, um, it has to have the save attribute, meaning that has to live for all execution of the program. Uh, if you've just got a simple program, you can just stick it in the main program and that's fine. Uh, but its dimension, its co-dimension has to be star because you cannot hard code how many images will run, will your program be executed with. Uh, so the star ends up with well, however many images we have at program startup. Uh, we can still ask this Im which image am I and how many images are there total. We're going to do that same. Uh, the, the biggest image is going to write a message. And here's where we get to race conditions and how do we do, how do I make sure that something happened on one image before we do another thing on a different image? Uh, the simplest form of synchronization we have is a sync all. Everybody gets, everybody waits here until everybody gets here. So this is how we guarantee that that message has been created on image, num it, the highest image number before anybody goes and tries to read it. So again, we're just going to, one image at a time, we're going to print the message that is on that image. So that those square brackets are how we do remote access. So what does that? Hello, sync, all. So what does that look like? So it looks for most purposes identical to the co-broadcast example, 
but instead of having an implicit synchronization and communication with co-broadcast, we have a more explicit one where we're using a co-array and a sync all statement. And if you execute it again, of course, they'll print it in a slightly different order. Okay, so that's, we're still doing very simplistic type stuff here. Um, but the point being that you do have to take care of avoiding race conditions because it would be, in theory, possible for image one to get here and try and read the message before image four has actually tried to write it. So that sync all is how you do that ordering of execution between images. Uh, Brad, can I ask a question? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, for the critical statement, so mm -hmm. I understand the critical statement section is going to be executed by one image at a given time, right? Mm -hmm. So in this example, if we do not have critical uh, clues, what, what's going to happen? What would be the difference? Um, for something as simple as this, it's probably not going to be noticeable. Okay. Because printing is somewhat, it is frequently kind of an atomic operation. Like, mm -hmm. what, you're not going to end up with the lines mixed together. Oh, okay. But if oh. I said... But if I, for example, put an extra print statement, you'll see that it actually, without the critical statement, oh. it might. There you go. Ah, oh, I see. But with the critical statement, those will never get mixed up. Oh, okay. Got it. Right? It will always yeah. say, it's it given order. Always. Image. Okay. Yeah. These will yeah. always occur together. Uh, even though the order of images that execute them will be somewhat random, mm -hmm. those two print statements will always come out together. Whereas without the critical, uh, it might interleave those in a weird way. Okay. Got it. Thank you. Mm hmm. Good question. All right, so uh, what's the next more complicated thing we can do? Uh, now we can start talking about uh, slightly more complicated communication patterns. In this example, basically every image is going to a single image to retrieve some data. That is a relatively straightforward communication pattern it's basically the reverse of the co-broadcast of like one image is telling everybody Here, here's my data um it's kind of the inverse but it's a it's an all to one type communication those can occasionally be a bottleneck if you're do if you're executing with say thousands or tens of thousands or even hundreds of thousands of images like if you do an all to one, like everybody's trying to do that communication at exactly the same time. And that can cause some issues in your network hardware <laughs> or just your network in general can start to get overwhelmed. Like if you if you're trying to do a hundred thousand broadcast a hundred thousand messages all at the exact same time, that's gonna cause a problem. Um so we can start to do more complicated uh data communication strategies. Uh, this one, we're just going to, I'm just going to send it to my neighbor. So we're going to do kind of a daisy chain. Like, uh, the, the image that creates the message is going to send it to its neighbor. Who's going to collect it and then send it to their neighbor, et cetera. So we're just going to go down the line. Uh, and so you can kind of like sequence out when the communications happen. And so they're not all, they're not all going to spam the network all at once. Uh, in this example, I'm going to do what's a, a two-sided communication, which turns out in Fortran is actually harder than the one-sided communication. Uh, if you're coming from MPI, you will have seen send and receive all the time, because that was the inherent way that MPI first came up with how, would, how do we do communication? Well, it's two-sided. Um, 
So we can, using a library that I wrote, we can do that two-sided communication. This is the example that only the NAG compiler can actually compile and execute. Um, basically, you end up trying to do, uh, an, you end up with needing an init like you would in MPI. Uh, we're still going to just do the me and num images, and the highest image is going to create that message. Uh, the other images are going to do something else, but uh, that first image, the, the highest image, he's going to do send to me minus one, my neighbor. And then the other images are going to start start off by receive from my, my neighbor. Um, when we're going to do communication, I don't know what the type is, so this library just uses class star. So this is it's called unlimited polymorphism. And then in order to get back to a state where I know what type a variable is, you need to do a select type. Uh, we know it's going to be a character, so we can. So basically, we're receiving a payload, doing select type, and then storing the the message in the variable. And then once we've all, once uh, once we've received, and then everybody but the last is going to do a send to. Um, but as soon as we're done sending our message on, we can go ahead and print the message we got. And so what does that look like? Hello, send, receive. You end up in a situation where more likely than not, they'll come out, the messages will end up coming out in from last to first. So four, three, two, one. Um, but the, the critical block will make it such that sometimes they're like, everybody will have gotten here by the time that there will be, there will be some images waiting at the beginning of the critical block. And so the order, if they're all, if there are multiple, there waiting the order that it, they get picked up and actually go through the critical block is kind of still somewhat random. And so the actual path of execution is that. Pretty much they're going to get to this point in reverse order, 4, 3, 2, 1. But the order that they end up going through it towards the end will be occasionally mixed up. Right. There's only like three send and receive pairs. Number four, received hello from four on four is actually just repeat its own messages. Um, so image four is the one that creates the message. Right, and then it sends it to okay. image three. Right. Yeah, so, so there, like, yeah, there's only three pairs. Three here. pairs. Yeah. So the four is just the I, I message. I have it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Four is only going to do a send, and one is only going to do a receive. Right. So that's where the you end up. That's why you end up with three pairs because it's only sending between three, three. There are three betweens. Right. But this would scale out to how you could do 128 on a single node on Perlmutter, right? And this would scale out just fine. Yeah, great. Um, but like I said, you'll need uh, an external library that actually does the the interesting stuff to enable to uh, uh, to image communication. So how would how would we do this if we didn't want to do um, two-sided communication? There's another synchronization statement. It's called sync images. And so when an image gets there, it will wait until the other images listed in the statement get there, and then it will continue. So we can do this still. We can end up still doing this like daisy chain communication where we go from the last image to the next image, right, and go down the line to do the communication where the big image, right, so we've gone back to a co right here. So the, the largest image is going to create a message and then it's going to wait until its neighbor 
has gotten there, and that and its neighbor is going to wait until its neighbor has gotten there. So you're going to have image image four is going to be waiting here while image three is waiting here. When they've both gotten there at the same time, then they can continue because now image three knows that when it goes to pick up the message from image four, that image four has in fact written it, right? And these, you always have to pair these up and make sure that they're paired up correctly because uh, every image has to wait for the image that it's waiting or like if in like when I get here when image three gets here it says I'm gonna wait on image four if image four never reaches a corresponding sync images statement that says it's waiting on image three image three is gonna wait there forever so this is a trickier communication strategy to get correct but it does allow you to kind of less in a less bulk synchronous way, do that synchronization, right? The coordination, right? It's not everybody gets here and waits and then everybody continues. It's we do this coordinate coordination in a less in a less bulk synchronous manner. And so when we do when we run the example, uh, I misspelled it. Sync images. There we go. In this example, you'll see it, uh, again, more frequently than not, they come out in reverse order. But occasionally, uh, the, sync, the, the critical block ends up playing a role and can reorder them. Uh, but this is basically the, the communication pattern is the same as the two-sided only actually have to have one image involved in the actual communication and that's the the square brackets there uh i saw william raise his hand do you have a question oh so this might be the way to do it in uh well it's cascading right huh? so, uh, zero sends to one one sends to two two sends to three and so on so uh, this is fine for like four images, but once you have say 100 images, wouldn't that be uh, not too efficient because it's like cascading, it's a serial process basically. Um, to a degree, you're, you're gonna end up staggering where your images are in execution. And for some applications that might be okay. Yeah, you, so, yeah, more, more likely than not, a lot of images will get there and then they're waiting until the, the communication has happened. But it kind of depends on environment a little bit, right? If I try and, if, if one image tries to just do a co-broadcast, right? Like I've got the data and I need everybody else to have it. Well, you, it can either send out 100,000 messages and overwhelm the network or you can manually do this daisy chain where at least we're not trying to just spam 100,000 messages at once yeah the the orchestration of like who's executing which images or at what point in the program ends up being kind of spread out a little bit but like i said that might be okay especially if you end up spreading out that type of uh synchronization the same way, like image one is now ready to send its Im its data to image two. Well, image two is just about to get there because it was delayed the last time around. So uh, there are trade offs. There's always trade offs, right? That's that's the nature of programming. Um, we can start to get uh, slightly more fancy with events. So an event is basically an atomic semaphore, right? So this is how images can signal to each other in a more lightweight way than explicit synchronization is like, 
hey, this thing happened, and then I can wait until that thing happens. So we do that with event post and event wait. So, so again, image four is going to create a message, and then it's going to post to its neighbor, hey, that message is ready. Its neighbor is going to wait until uh, it's been told that message is ready. And so events always have to be a co-array. Event post will almost always involve a co-indexed object. So co-index is the, you know, the thing in square brackets. Um, because event wait is always not co-indexed. So I'm always working with my local copy of the co-array. And so you, you can only do the, the post and wait. A remote image can post an event to you, and then you can wait on it. But you can't do it the reverse way, where, uh, uh, where an image posts to itself, and then you wait on some remote image. It, it's always that, that other the other direction, where it's uh, I can wait until an image has posted to me. Um, but and again, these end up generally having to be strictly balanced. But now there's no actual synchronization other than ensuring that one thing happens before another. So as soon as image four has posted to image three, it can move on. It no longer is waiting for image three to get to this statement. And so, so you get slightly less uh, orchestrated and synchronized sequencing of the execution here. Uh, let's see. Hello, event. And yeah, the, the order still can be a little bit mixed up due to the critical, but yeah, you're still doing the daisy chain of, of communications. Here comes the, here's where we start to get into the more interesting actual patterns that you can start to do. Uh, let's see, yeah, and this is, this is the last example. So here's where we do an asynchronous queue, basically. Um, so I've got, uh, now I'm making message ready here, an array, and, and because it's an array, I'm gonna make it allocatable. Uh, we're going to have, hey, did I print that message? Um, and we're going to do some, some, something slightly more interesting. I'm going to use the stdlib system uh, module. So for uh, the stdlib project uh, from the Fortran Lang organization, uh, they've got an implementation of sleep because sleep is not a standard intrinsic, uh, but they've got an implementation that works. Uh, so, so, yeah, go ahead, William. That's handy. Uh, right now, I actually uh, write an interface block to call Lipsy's um, NanoSleep. <laughs> yeah, um, I have I have frequently written code that just does call sleep, and then found out later that oh, that's a G Fortran extension. <laughs> so. If you're using G Fortran, you can just call sleep because it just works. But if you're trying to be more portable and standards conformant, yeah, you should use an external library for that. Um, right. Anyway. We are also targeting Cray, uh, NVIDIA, AMD. So, yeah. So yeah, it wouldn't work that way then. Yep, exactly. So, uh, you know, me and this images. So what we're going to do is If so, image number one is going to be the reporter image. Uh, so it's going to tell all of the other images, including itself, hey, you can overwrite the message now. I'm done with it. Right. Then every image is going to wait until it's okay to overwrite the message. It's going to write a message to its own copy, 
and then it's going to do some work, right? This is this is what sleep is, why I use sleep is like we're going to simulate that we're going to actually do something and wait, pretend that producing this message takes some time. And then we're going to tell image one, my message is ready, right? And so this is why this this message ready needed to be allocatable and an array because we need it to be as big as how many images we have. Because really only image one is going to use this. Um, but every so every image is going to post an event to image one saying, hey, my message is ready. And so image one is then going to say, uh, I haven't printed any of the messages. And while I haven't printed all of them, I'm going to loop through. I'm going to say, if I haven't printed that message yet, I'm going to see if that if that message is ready. And so this is where you can check whether an event has been posted without doing a wait. Because so the event query doesn't actually order things in the strict sense, but it's a way of like, hey, is is that message ready? Uh, which would say, which would be it. So if uh, count is greater than zero, it means that something has posted to that event, uh, meaning it's ready. You still have to do the event wait to balance the posts and waits. Then I can go and print it. And then I can post back to that image. Oh, uh, you can overwrite it now. And I'm going to keep track that that I have printed it. And then at the v and we're going to go ahead and go through this loop ten times, just arbitrarily. Uh, and then at the at the very end, we still need one last event wait. Um, right, because the end program or stop is an implicit synchronization point that deallocates the co-arrays. So if an image gets to the end program before image one has finished printing that message, then its copy of the co-array may have gone away and doing this access may actually fail. And then even, and actually what I saw before I added the event wait was that this failed because well that image had started normal termination so you can't post an event to it so you actually need this event wait here to make sure that well none of the images start to finish execution until their image or their message has been printed uh, but anyway so what does it look like Hello from everyone. When we've got something that looks like a more realistic work pattern of like all the images have work to do and then one image is going to collect up uh, the answers. And we've just kind of simulated a random amount of work for each image. And so what you'll see is um, as we get through the loop, uh, the way we've done the synchronization is such that, or coordination, right? There's really very little synchronization happening here. It's just coordination. The way we've done the coordination is that image one is going to print all of the messages from the first time through the loop, and then all the messages from the second time through the loop, et cetera. And so what you'll see is it will always print its own message first because you're kind of guaranteed that um, it's ready, and that's the first one it's going to try. But after that, they will be in a somewhat arbitrary order. It looks like more often than not, it goes 4, 3, 2. But like the last one goes 1, 2, 3, 4, right? So there, there is, they're unsynchronized and unordered, but we have prevented any of those race conditions. So we've done the coordination correctly. And so that is 
all of the examples that I had. Are there any additional questions? And like I said, that is just the like getting started high level. Oh, here are some things that you could think about doing with co-arrays. All right, well, if there aren't any other questions, I will open the floor for other discussion. Uh, William's got a question. Um, is there a notion of communicators like in MPI? Um, say um, we write a Laplace solver and we want to like exchange ghost regions, things like that. How do you do that mm -hmm. in uh, PGAS? Um, you can uh, do it asynchronously, right? So you don't have to use a communicator. Um, if you wanted to do groups, uh, Fortran has teams. So if you wanted to kind of do group communication, you can do it that way. Um, I, I showed an example of how you can reinvent two-sided communication with a communicator. So you can kind of reinvent that, reinvent that with co-arrays. Um, uh, but most co-array codes that are doing those like ghost halo exchanges, uh, they do it async in a more asynchronous way, kind of like with sync images is a pretty common way. Events is a pretty common way, um, but but you end up being able to do it kind of more asynchronously than send and receive. Right, right, okay. And it's actually easier to get that correct as well, because it's really easy to say. Here, I'll sh I'll show the example that is on the documentation. Nurse, the NERSC documentation. Let me find it real quick. Because I actually rewrote it because I'm pretty sure it was incorrect. Uh, development languages. No, uh, programming models. So if you go to the NERSC documentation, let me share real quick. So if you go to the nurse documentation under development programming models, there's a co-arrays page. And you know, there's a little bit of an overview blurb about co-arrays there. Uh, and they show, you know, here's an here's an example in MPI about how you would do Halo Exchange, right? Ghost zones. Um, didn't have these these if checks before they call MPI send. Well, if you don't have that if check, basically what happens is everybody's trying to do a send at the same time. And so nobody's available to do a receive. That's a deadlock, right? So it's actually, it's actually really easy to write deadlock code with MPI, two-sided communication. It's actually easier to write the one-sided co-array communication and not get it wrong. And that will actually be faster because you don't have to do the synchronization. So yeah, the, the equivalent, so the, the two-sided MPI code you have to write is this long. The one-sided co-array code you have to write is two lines. Um, any other questions? All right. If not, like I said, uh, we'll open it up for any general discussion anybody wants to have. Um, please feel free to email me ideas for next training session. When, how, what topic, etc. cetera. Um, I'm Still going to keep trying to do these office hours on a monthly basis as well. And so I'm always open to topics you want to hear about, um, you know, kind of a brief overview or, you know, a little little introduction to any of the topics that you want um, or anything else you want to make use of. We've got an hour a month. Anything you want to hear about, talk about. Um, I'm open to people showing off uh, any other projects. Like if you want to say, hey, 
if you've got a, hey, this is what I did in this project, it was really cool, you all might be interested in hearing about it, um, please let me know. I'd be happy to give you some time to present to the rest of the group too. But if, if there's nothing else, um, I can give you all a few minutes of your time back if, if that's what, uh, if we're all done. All right, I will go ahead and stop the recording and